Good day, everyone. Welcome to the second web talk in the CAF series, Extremism and Antisemitism. I'm Andrea Spindle, Executive Director of the Canadian Antisemitism Education Foundation, a registered charitable organization that depends on individual donors. If you would like to support our work and help us to continue to bring you important webinars, produce informative bulletins, challenge the antisemitism in our communities across Canada and in partnership with our American friends, educate people on Israel's history and legality, build programs of Jewish pride and resiliency, and carry out action under the rubric of the End Jew Hatred Civil Rights Movement, please donate at www.caef.ca. You can donate at that site in Canada or in the US and receive a charitable tax receipt. Our current series is exploring the most serious forms and sources of antisemitism, those deemed extremist, whether they threaten us directly, have resulted in physical and or mental harm, or because they come from extremist ideas and organizations, whether on the left or right of the political spectrum. It is pretty much self-evident that extremist views and behaviors have consequences for the well-being of all society and the very future of our freedoms and our democracy. Among the most extremist views, are those of radical Islam, often referred to as Islamism and Islamofascism. Oddly enough, the allies of Islamism are more often extremist on the left, but as was once explained to me by an anti-communist, the continuum of authoritarianism isn't a straight line, but a circle where alt-right and alt-left meet. Islamists seem quite comfortable on either side, choosing what best suits their agenda, morphing like an amoeba, acting like a shapeshifter. Once seemingly confined to the Middle East, radical Islam now operates across the, glo the globe, no less in North American society, and unfortunately in all aspects of life, especially political life. Just before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to take a minute to just recognize and thank all of today's co-sponsors. We are really thrilled and delighted to have received support from across many organizations in Canada and the US and even in Europe. So we are partnered with Harut Canada, Jewish Resistance, Lodger Synagogue, Americans for Peace and Tolerance, End Jew Hatred Canada, the Matatias Project, the Israel Action Coalition for East Bay, the Atlanta Israel Coalition, Israel Committee of Sonoma County, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, European Lawyers for Israel, Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, Stand With Us Canada, the Deborah Project, the Israel Defense and Security Forum, the Israel Activist Calendar, Canadian Institute for Jewish Research, the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, Israel Advocacy Alliance, the Bedin Center for Near East Policy Research, Jewish NGOs at the UN, the New England Friends of the March of the Living, and the Afghanistan-Israel Friendship Association. Again, thanks to all of those great organizations I refer all of you to consider supporting. Today, we are fortunate to have an expert in this field of Islamism and anti-Semitism, Dr. Alex Jaffe, editor of the BDS Monitor of Scholars for Peace in the Middle East, and a senior non-resident fellow of the Began Sadat Center for Strategic Studies at Bar Ilan University. Alex's work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Project Syndicate, American Interest, National Interest, National Journal, Times of Israel, Jewish Ideas Daily, Haaretz, Ynet, Jerusalem Post, Tablet, Hudson, New York, Pajamas Media, and many, many other sites. Trained as an archaeologist and historian, Alex holds a PhD in Near Eastern Studies from the University of Arizona and has participated and directed archaeological research in Israel, Jordan, Greece, and the United States. He taught at Pennsylvania State University and Purchase College and has worked in the Middle East Forum, Global Policy Exchange, and the David Project. In addition to writing for the media, Alex writes monographs for research organizations and has extensive experience as a ghostwriter. He's also published over 150 items in scholarly journals as on archaeology, ancient and modern history, political science, 
environmental studies, and cultural affairs. He has spoken widely regarding international and domestic affairs, specializing in the Middle East and international affairs, American cultural, polit cultural politics, Jewish affairs, anti-Semitism, nationalism, environmental security, intelligence reform, arms control, higher education, and of course, archeology. span After he presents, he will take questions from the audience. So please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen. Please be respectful in the chat and let us know where you are from where you're listening to us. This webinar is now being recorded and the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel and available to all who are here today. Thank you very much and welcome, Alex. Well, thanks very much for, um, for the introduction and for the, for the kind words um, and for the invitation to talk about some very interesting, very complicated and controversial subject. Um, and I think that it's so important and, and so controversial in some respects that we need to start with some definitions and, and qualifications. Um, Islamism is political Islam. It's, in some respects, it's traditionalist Islam. It's uncompromising Islam that believes that Islam should dominate all spheres of, of life, uh, including politics, including personal behavior, collapses the distance between public and private. Not all, is, not all Muslims um, around the world are Islamists in, in the, according to this definition. And it's very important to, to make this distinction that um, probably a substantial majority of Muslims around the world, including in North America, including in the United States, are um, of the mindset that, the, that there is a distinction between public and private. But what we want to talk about, what I want to talk about a bit is um, Islamism, and that is political Islam that is aimed to reshape politics and culture. Politics in this respect also is, is not simply a question of uh, elected officials. Politics has to be understood much more broadly as um, not simply officials and candidates, but um, activities designed to affect society, to change society. And this includes the electoral process, but also um, the educational sphere, the philanthropic sphere, um, general patterns of, of discourse uh, and behavior. And it, it's a question of, of taking beliefs, in this case, Muslim beliefs, traditional um, Muslim beliefs, beyond the question, beyond the, the, the issues of, of, um, of acceptance and integration into US society and North American society, and um, shifting those those societies towards um, a, not simply accommodation, but um, but behavioral changes that are in line with Muslim beliefs and practices. Um, who wants to change the system? Who who wants to change fundamental policies of the system? And this really brings us to one of the first and I think most important point is that um, Islamists in the US, certainly in Canada and certainly in Europe, um, have made common cause or found common cause with socialists and communists. And this is sometimes called the, the red-green alliance. And the question is always who is, uh, who's in charge and who is the helpful idiot in this equation. But the fact remains that across uh, Europe, certainly, there are broad cultural coalitions, social coalitions, and political parties that unite essentially socialists, communists, and Islamists in efforts to fundamentally change the shape um, and the future of European societies. There are also um, 
Islamist political parties all around Europe. And one of the impacts of this, um, again, just to continue with the European example, has been uh, seen in the, in the Labour Party in the UK, where a small faction, the Momentum faction under Jeremy Corbyn, essentially um, took over the party for a period of time and made anti-Israel politics and anti-Semitism some of the defining features along with more traditional socialist kinds of, kinds of features uh, or policy, policy goals. All, all immigrant politics, wherever you go in the world, um, they, has, they all have similar kinds of, kinds of features solidarity, support for, for immigrants uh, and their, their cultures, acceptance and integration. With respect to talking about Islam in North America and in the United States in particular, there's really only one issue on which the community has been united since at least the 1930s, and that's opposition to Zionism and opposition to Israel. And this has been basic to Muslim and Arab politics in the US really all along. And it's out of this um, impulse that um, organizational politics began to emerge in the 50s, but especially the 1960s and, and later. The, the Muslim community in the United States is very complex. There are, it's predominantly Sunni, there's a substantial Shia minority. Um, there are very important distinctions to be made between immigrant communities from Pakistan, from Afghanistan, the older communities who came out of mandatory Palestine, the Christian Arab communities that came from Lebanon, um, the Egyptian communities, and, and so on. Most Arab politics, not all, but most Arab politics in America has been united in its opposition to Zionism and, and Israel. Not exclusively, um, not 100%, but that's been a, a common theme. Now, if we contrast this, say, with um, Irish American politics, Irish American politics have uh, a similar, some similar kinds of dimensions. I, Irish Immigrants started coming here in the middle of the 19th century, and most of them who were most of them were Catholics, um, who were very strongly opposed to um, British imperialism, British domination of <clears throat> of Ireland, and this had very concrete political implications um, in the United States as well as in Ireland and the UK. Uh, really until the present, certainly in the 20th, 20th century, when these issues were, were violently um, fought out. So um, it's, it's important to recognize the complexity of the community, the disagreements, but also the agreements. Um, these are communities, the Muslim American community, from what I can tell, from what I've been told, doesn't necessarily agree about a lot, um, and they, there are very strong distinctions to be made. So let me talk a little bit about that community, um, uh, and it's a, it's a separate topic in itself. Um, the estimates now are about 3.45 million Muslim Americans, so around one, a little over 1% of the, of the population. It may be a little bit exaggerated, population estimates of any ethnic community or religious community tend to be um, exaggerated largely for political effect. Concentrated very strongly in Illinois, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, Texas, Michigan, Florida. Um, there have been, since 1992, there have been 1.7 million um, Muslim immigrants approximately to the United States. So the community has very nearly doubled in the last 30, 30 years. And this has coincided 
with um, or overlapped, however you want to put it, with um, other external trends which have affected the politics of the community and the politics of the United States um, as a whole. So starting in the 1960s, um, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, an organization um, founded in Egypt, but largely funded by, um, by Saudis, certainly by the 1960s it was founded, began a concerted effort globally to export its own brand of Islam um, around the world, including to the United States. So globally, thousands and thousands and thousands of mosques were built, which transformed the practice of Islam in places like Indonesia, um, uh, all, all around Southeast Asia, all around Africa, and including in, in the United States as well. It's a concerted effort beginning in the 1960s and, and accelerating from there uh, to, to, to literally purchase um, facilities throughout the United States. So at, at the moment, the estimate is something like 50 to 80% of mosques in America are, are owned, in effect, by the North American Islamic Trust, which is a, uh, an organization dominated by uh, Saudi money, controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood Network, which shapes political, which shapes religious um, opinion, which places um, preachers and teachers in mosques all around the country, and which, at least until recently, has been very much oriented towards um, st strict Wahhabi kinds of kinds of practices. And it's part of a network of organizations, this middle Muslim Brotherhood Network that again goes back to the 1960s, the Council for American Islamic Relations, the Muslim Student Association, Islamic Societies of North America. Uh, importantly for understanding the BDS movement, Students for Justice in Palestine, American Muslims for, um, for Palestine, these are, these are outward facing organizations which address different, um, different components of the American Muslim community and the um, American society at large, political, uh, in terms of political action, in terms of cultural influences from the local level to the, to the national level. It's very much shaped what I deal with um, much of my time, which is um, understanding the BDS movement which is to, to a very large extent, uh, an element of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's an emanation of the Muslim Brotherhood network in America. These organizations um, have contributed to setting the tone on college campuses. And one of the interesting phenomena that is, has direct relevance for sort of tradi understanding traditional politics, political politics, you might say, is that student activists um, in St Students for Justice in Palestine or Muslim Student Association groups on campus end up going to law schools, end up um, doing internships with national organizations like CARE um, or the Islamic Societies in North America, end up being um, staffers uh, in, on Capitol Hill, and in some cases end up running for um, local and national offices. And there is, there is a pipeline. Now, some of this is sort of understandable, traditional American, American politics that, you know, it's actually much more familiar from, from British politics, you might say, that student organizations on campus are the incubators for um, future politicians and for future politically involved individuals. In, in the case of the Muslim Brotherhood Network, uh, these, or, these individuals have particular interests and orientations, again, united around a, a central, one of the central concepts, and that is 
that um, Israel is illegitimate and Zionism, you know, Jewish nationalism as expressed by Jews and others outside of Israel is, is illegitimate. And it's very much, all, all of these attitudes are very much meshed with what you might call 21st century, um, pheno- the 21st century phenomenon of identity politics, where one's ethnic or religious identity um, is a badge of authenticity and, and a, a way to advance oneself within the political, within the political process. And um, unfortunately, what we've seen in the past, and it continues to be the case, is that um, these kinds of um, attitudes and individuals on campus have influenced, um, have, have, have generated increasingly hostile environments for Jews and Jewish students and, and faculty on campus and um, contributed to the larger BDS movement in in the US. So and I'll give you I'll give you a few examples. Um, Keith Ellison, who's now the I believe the Attorney General of Minnesota and he was a former representative in the House of Representatives, was at one point a, I believe, a Students for Justice in Palestine member and who advanced to national and then to local office. And, um, you know, other, other, famous, other famous individuals don't have, uh, most notably, um, Canadian neighbor representative Ilhan Omar, Somali um, native, who has a particular kind of chameleon-like um, approach to her politics, um, very much a tr- very much which but it's also a, a sort of postmodern you might say islamism um and, and, which makes her in a sense a good example um her, her father was a member of of a previous regime they fled the country they came to america um but she she's been married a few times and um you know and changes her story um, periodically. But one of the, again, one of the central threads is that um, she's really quite implacably opposed to, to Israel, to, Amer- to the American relationship with Israel and, and so on. So there are a lot of these, there are a number of these um, kinds of individuals at really all levels of, of politics. I'll mention another person who, who actually um, is an important, interesting figure. Her name is Nita Alam in Durham, North Carolina. She sits on the Durham County Board of Commissioners and was one of the central figures in getting the city of Durham to um, adopt a BDS resolution, which cut off um, the the Durham city police from doing exchanges with uh, with Israeli police. She ran for the House of Representatives uh, back in a primary and uh, lost her primary back in the spring, but she's now she's still on the um, she's still on the the Durham County Board. And there are many 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 examples like like her all over the the United States. In on local uh, on local city councils and uh, county boards, on local uh, school boards, and and so on. Um, now the question then becomes, uh, you know, are, are uh, how do we deal with how do we deal with this? Political participation in America is a is a right. Um, there are there are. You know, out and out communists who who run for political office and not infrequently win in the United States, um, and you know, including in including in New York City, um, the Democratic the 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 organization called Democratic Socialists of America has it as its explicit policy 
um, what is called entryism. They're basically trying to take over the Democratic Party from, from within um, and have done so in a number of cities and states. And when they do, th their policy is explicitly um, anti-Israel. It's explicitly it's arguably anti-Semitic, it's explicitly anti-American with respect to excoriating um, America for sins past and present, ranging from slavery to imperialism to all sorts of other, again, real and imagined <laughs> sorts, of, uh, sorts of things. Um, so it's an it's an issue that has to be has to be kept on the front burner. But keeping it on the front burner burner is a a culturally and politically and and frankly ethically difficult process because you can't. This is this is America. You can't. There are no religious tests. That's explicitly forbidden to have a religious test for office in the United States, and that's how it's always been, and that's how it how it should be. Um, on the other hand, there is this phenomenon as it, throughout Europe and uh, the UK and Canada of entryism where frankly obnoxious or dangerous characters um, who express incredibly hateful and destructive kinds of philosophies and ideologies and wishes um, are now part of the system. Um, and I'll, what was the name of the, what's his name um, in uh, Abrar Omish in, no, not uh, Laith Maruf in, in Canada, who um, seems to be the anti-Semite in charge of anti-racism um, overseeing Canadian broadcasting. Now, you know, Canada is is unusual in that, um, as I understand it, the fe the federal government has essentially taken over broadcasting, and sh shovels money to different broadcasters in exchange for, obviously, um, good coverage of the sort that it that it wants, and it's hired a, apparently, and an out and out anti semite to be in charge of anti racism, and this is this is illustrative of the problem of human rights commissions and anti-racism um, and diversity commissars in, in Western society as a whole is that more often than not, they turn out to be the biggest racists around and not infrequently they're, they're Muslim racists whose ire is focused um, rather particularly on Jews and, and Israel. This is especially pernicious within the government. So during the Obama administration, there were purges of individuals in the intelligence community and the, and the, um, in the military who were concerned about um, Islamism in, in the domestic setting and internationally. And training materials were, were sanitized and the whole concept was written off as being hopelessly racist. And a, a number of racists, some of whom were Muslim, were put in charge of, of the process. And this has influenced our ability to perceive problems correctly and clearly. Um, and the, the same goes for, uh, for law, law enforcement, that uh, one can't talk about the threat of terrorism in the United States or in the West generally. Um, and we've seen this actually, you know, quite explicitly with, in the United States with the um, Department of Homeland Security, which was a sort of Frankenstein's monster created um, after 9-11, which um, under the Biden administration has stood on its head to characterize white supremacists as the greatest threat to American um, internal security. Whereas if you look at the numbers of actual people who get killed 
it's um, largely Muslims of a, of a great variety, including um, a nation of Islam. So a sort of strange indigenous black Muslim sect created in North America um, in the earlier 20th century and its offshoots um, who've done as much or more killing than white separatists or white supremacists, whatever you want to call them. But these things have been largely taken off the radar because the reigning ideology is anti-racism. And that's the, that's the zeitgeist of, of today within, um, within Western societies and certainly the United States. So again, my point is that it's not simply electoral politics that, um, that we, we want to be concerned about. We want to be concerned about cultural politics. We want to be concerned about local politics, about what goes on in your school board. So I'll give you another example that the liberated, li liberation curriculum that's been adopted in a number of California school districts, which mandates um, that the California school districts mandate ethnic studies that high school graduate high school kids can't graduate without taking taking so-called ethnic studies in order to apparently remedy the the lack of understanding of other ethnic groups but the liberated curriculum um, as it's called um, is specifically anti-racist it's specifically anti-imperialist and targeted for specific criticism are Jews in Israel, Jews for being part of the part of the ruling class, the ownership class in Israel as being the, the little Satan imperialist lackey of the United States and, and so on. In electoral terms, um, and I, I, I made a list, a, a lot of the, a lot of the less famous Islamist um, candidates have actually lost their their primaries um, this this summer um, since the spring in, in the U.S. So, Huweda Araf, who was one of the founders of the of the uh, international solidarity movement, so called, one of the key early BDS groups, she lost badly in in Michigan, no less, and. Uh, uh, a woman named Rana uh, Abdel Hamid had to, in New York City had to pull out because she was running in a district where two um, Democratic heavyweights were going head to head, and the list goes the list goes on. Um, but the danger is thinking that that's the that's the only kind of threat that that there is to American politics and to Jews and supporters of Israel within America. Now, I, I should say something, and I'm just trying to be mindful of, of the time so we can get in lots of questions, that um, one of the, of the interesting and disturbing kinds of phenomena in more recent years, the last two, three, four, five years, is that um, Islamists are making, uh, are, are, are becoming allies of the far right in the United in the United States and and elsewhere, it used to be certainly in in Europe that uh, neo, neo Nazis didn't have time for um, certainly for the BDS movement, but they would they would be okay with boycotting Israel. They would say that from from time to time. But because of the larger process of of polarization and the larger craziness that has um, unfolded in American politics. And I think in, in global politics, um, all sorts of strange and disturbing kinds of alliances are, are emerging. So, you know, Islamists aren't exclusively Democrats anymore. They're almost exclusively Democrats, but not 100%. So um, in, I think it's, Texas, the Republican candidate for attorney general. I have to check my notes. Um, you know, the the tweets have come to come to light. So when you when you when you tweet, just know that it's going to come to light sooner or later. Um, and you know, the Republicans have their own 
crazies, not least of whom people like Marjorie Taylor Greene in Georgia, who are um, more and more overtly Christian nationalists, some of whom are really quite positive about Jews in Israel, and some of whom really, really aren't. Um, so all of these things are sort of metastasizing in, in quite upsetting kinds of ways. And again, the question is what, what to do about it. Um, and the, the, first, the first thing is obviously to read up on your candidates. And, you know, we just had an election earlier this week, a primary election where I live. The, the candidate um, is a proud member of the squad, an ally of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tlaib, whom I didn't even bother to talk about, um, who's basically just, she's the representative of Palestinian nationalism in the U.S. Senate, uh, U.S. Congress. Um, and and he won by a rather overwhelming margin. On the other hand, in other districts, there's been good success um, exposing and um, forcing a vote on, on Islamists and their, and their allies. And it's worth mentioning that, you know, again, the, the US has a federal structure. You've got the House, you've got the Senate, there are lots of elections, they're always going on. We never get away from it. Um, so there, there's a lot of candidates and there's a lot of churn. Read up on your candidates. Um, and you know, if there's somebody that you really don't like, make a contribution to their opponent that you really do like and get out there and vote because if you, if you don't, somebody else will. And you know, the turnout, <coughs> excuse me, there's a there's a, an election in, in Manhattan, in lower Manhattan, on a crazily shaped house district. And um, one of the candidates is a strong BDS supporter who then attempted to walk back her support. Um, and the other is a, a, a lawyer and a strong Trump opponent. This is the Democratic primary. And as of this morning, there was less than a thousand votes. They were separated by less than a thousand votes, and something like a total of thirty thousand people bothered to come out and vote. So that's how tight the margins can be between the good guys and the bad guys, and uh, and expect that the bad guys are going to lie to you. That's how Rashida Talib. Um, infamously snookered the Jewish community in the Detroit area um, about uh, not claiming that she wasn't hostile to Israel and, and so on. Um, okay, so let me, let me stop there. And I see that there's a bunch of questions and maybe we can, maybe we can take this in other directions as well. Okay, thank you so much, Alex. Before sure. we get to questions, I want to just make a few observations for people uh, that follow from what you said. I want to stress the importance of being active uh, politically now because of the things you described. In Canada, in Ontario, we see the uh, school board elections coming up, and we know there are several boards that are heavily dominated by leftist slash Islamist slash pro Palestinian uh, boycotters, and it's and there's also evidence of increasing anti-Semitism in the schools. So I can't help but make a political um, advertisement right now, which is to really encourage people to pay attention with school board elections, which are October in Ontario. I don't know about the rest of Canada, I haven't checked dates, but it's incredibly important. And, um, and secondly, the um, you, I'm so glad you mentioned Leith Marouf, the anti-racist racist, and uh, the funding of an organization that he and his wife actually created in order to attract the funds which would allow him to then treat or teach anti-racism. We don't know for how long he's been doing it. There's a reason to believe he's been a consultant for 20 years and maybe has been spewing his poison for that long. So I wanna to draw to the attention of Canadians that our organization is calling for a national inquiry a public inquiry into the workings of this organization that was set up, community 
Media Advocacy Center that he and his wife created. They don't seem to be board members, but he was a paid consultant. And so on, well, tomorrow, I am going to send out uh, in my um, usual way a special bulletin that will tell people how they can sign a petition to support the call for an inquiry. And also in dealing with school boards, I want to draw to people's attention that we're partnered with over 40 organizations in the Ottawa area to sponsor something called Rise Up Ottawa, scheduled for November 6th to focus on what's happening in the educational system and to build, bring Jews together, learn how to com how to combat, how to speak up, how to stand proudly as Jews and how to work collectively to combat some of the anti-Semitism. So I'll be sharing information about those two things. And I just wanna make sure people are aware of that and watch for it and sign up for both of them. So back to questions. You spoke about a lot of the organizations that are Islamist, so identified, so easily identified. And are they not all, um, have they not all sprung from the Muslim Brotherhood? And if the Brotherhood has been banned in countries like Saudi Arabia and UAA, why cannot America, Canada also ban the Muslim Brotherhood? Not all of them um, came out of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, there are a number of Shia organizations. Shia organizations are particularly active in the UK, um, but also in, in the States. A number of them are of there, there are internal ethnic divisions, South Asian versus uh, versus Arab, and um, and so on. But as to the larger question, why can't they be banned? Well, that's a big that's a big question. I never I never quite understood that. Um, it's a huge policy continuity across many American administrations that uh, the decision was despite all the evidence um the decision was was made at some level by by people not to um not to ban the organization now it, at one level it's very it would be very difficult because none of these there, there's no one organization that has a sign on the door that says muslim brotherhood you know ring the bell please come in on the other hand, a number of them have clear institutional and ideological connections. Um, they've been very, all, all these organizations have been very, very um, cagey about their public personas. And so CARE, for example, represents itself as essentially a human rights or civil rights organization. And you know, the optics of, of the justice, the US Justice Department shutting down or prescribing one of these organizations like CARE um, for material support for terrorism or, or whatever would be very, very difficult. And then proving that in court would be, would be very, very difficult. There, are, there have been and there are um, terror support cases <clears throat> which involve American Muslim organizations. Um, the most famous one, obviously, is the Holy Land Foundation case. But this has been litigated. It, it was litigated. It's it's ongoing. And as a political, so as a political decision, and also as a kind of law enforcement decision, uh, it, it's very difficult. One of the one of the things, obviously, that came out of the Holy Land Foundation case, where where it was shown they had the actual checks that officers of the foundation were sending money to Hamas. Um, it was clear that, um, you know, as soon, as soon as they, they, they were caught and as soon as the judgment was levied against them by the, by the court, the organization dissolved and um, they said, we have no money to pay the judgment for the terrorism uh, uh, award that was that was given, and then, eighteen months, two years later, uh, the same individuals formed a new organization, and continued some of the activities. So these kinds of cases are extremely difficult to to prosecute, particularly if you uh, if you don't have access to high level intelligence um, material, 
And so I know, assume that's the same with um, an inability to monitor what's actually going on in the mosques, where we know there are preachers who preach anti-Semitism and call for the destruction of Israel and and lead attacks. When we have protests in the city, we've seen recently that the buses are coming from the mosques. Well, there there are several there are several problems there. Yes, it yes it's true. So after nine eleven in in the New York area, the, the greater New York area, there was a program that was launched by the New York City Police Department to monitor what what, what was being said in in mosques, and there were other initiatives that were take undertaken nationwide, and some of the results were really quite horrifying. Uh, with respect to, um, you know, direct incitement of, of violence, as well as, you know, broader sorts of negative discriminatory kinds of um, statements. Um, I think it was about 10 or 12 years ago, the, certainly the New York City program was shut down by the American, after a suit from the American Civil Liberties Union, which alleged um, that this constituted illegal surveillance by the government and illegal policing of free speech. And you know what, there's, that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate point. Um, on the, given the, given the, the American legal traditions of free speech and uh, requirements for surveillance and so on. Now in a place like France, there are no such uh, restrictions. And every month or two, a, a mosque in France will be shut down. And the, the preacher deported back to wherever he comes from, precisely because um, that preacher is, is preaching direct violence and incitement. Um, so, you know, this, this is a, there are limitations that the Anglo-American legal tradition has to has to put up with, um, you know. Look, but that said, there's ample and ample um, evidence for the involvement of a number of mosques and the the leadership of a number of mosques in the um, the two world in the World Trade Center bombing and in uh, the 9/11 case. So what's the line? What's what are the what are the limits? What are the parameters? What do you have to go to a judge with, um, or uh, or a state attorney general, and say this is going on? Uh, lots of my understanding is that um, state attorney attorneys general um, want to know about these kinds of things, but the level to make the the information actionable to for surveillance much less for arrest is very very high right. um and what the intelligence committee uh, uh community knows is completely unclear right. to to me Seems um, similar here. Similar. and it's a very but these are these are very high you know, there, there are very high bars to to do anything about it, unlike in Europe. In Europe, there's there are busts going on all the time. Um, and there are even plots as, being thwarted all the even time. Even as it's growing there too, right? Yes. Well, um, and you know, the 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 growth there is is of a quantitatively different sort. Than, than what we see thus far in North America. And the, the radicalization of the Muslim populations are very much larger. The amount of radicalization that goes on is very much higher. The role of mosques is very much more pronounced. Look, in, at least in the United States, um, the tradition of assimilation is very strong. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why people want to come here legally and, and not, is that you can free yourself from whatever it is that you were before. And 
the, pa the pattern that we see in the United States is with respect to radicalization is very much that, uh, you know, the immigrants, immigrants come and they want to be Americans. It's their children who, um, for a variety of reasons, become radicalized because they they want something they want something authentic that that they think their parents have lost they can't go back or they're caught in between the two societies they don't feel like they fit in entirely in american society and they don't fit in with traditional society or they go back to the the the, the motherland and they find something they find something there that radicalizes them um, so there's no one, there's no one equation, but this is, this is very, the opportunities are very much greater in American society than they are in European society. Frankly, in European society, um, the, the exclusion of, of Muslims from mainstream integration, um, is, is very much more pronounced. And that is one of the factors that has led to radicalization. And, and the horrendous um, consequences for, for everybody, for social cohesion and, and you know, violence as a whole in European society. So I hope that we can avoid it because to at least a little bit because we are, we stay true to our traditions as Americans, can't speak for Canadians. Um, there, there are several questions about working with Muslim community organizations, and, and obviously there are Muslims who reach out to the Jewish community, and I want to acknowledge that because two of our sponsors are Muslim organizations. Those in Canada will be familiar with Muslims facing tomorrow, and, uh, and of course we have our friends from Af the Afghanistan-Israel Friendship Society or Association. But there is also in the US, and members are Canadian, the Council for Muslims Against Anti-Semitism. It remains very small. I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with it. And, and, um, and, and the question is, why is this not growing? Why is there not a large reform movement? Or if there is, why do we hear so little about it? There, there is a, a reform movement in, in Islam generally. It's diffused, and I'm not an expert on this by, by any means. But my perception is that there is a, there is a, a I wouldn't call it a movement. There's a, a trend, and um, it's certainly in Muslim countries. It's largely suppressed because, or or down certainly downplayed because it's uh, all of these countries have official religions, and that official religion is is Islam. Um, you know, when you look at a place like like Iran, Shia, almost exclusively Shia, uh, what little information there is suggests that um, most people are irreligious. Most people don't go to the mosque. Women have stopped having children. People are, by and large, disgusted with Islam as it is um, promulgated or expressed by the ruling institutions. And there, the the, the ruling is religious institutions are the state and the state are the ruling institution of uh, religious institutions and people have had enough. And one of the signs of them having had enough is that they just don't want to have children anymore. The population, um, the rate is, has plummeted there. And these kinds of things are, these kinds of phenomena are found all over, all over the world. It's, it's sort of more profound in a sense in, in, in Iran because it is so, so Islamic, you might say. Um, but it doesn't get attention. On the one hand, um, mainstream, mainstream, Muslim organizations are, um, don't want this to get out because it, it works against their brand. It works against their political power. Um, reformism, is 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 not good for it's not good for business. Um, there's also a, a a phenomenon, let's say, in Islam historically, going back 
virtually to the very beginning that there, there have always been reformers of one sort or another, non-traditionalists, non-literalists, um, who've deviated, let's say, from the, the, the absolutist text interpretation of, of the text. But equally, there are traditionalists, often from the margins, from the far out places, who, um, who then challenge reformers and, and force not a reformation, but a, a, um, a uh, revanchist return to, the, to tradition. And that's sort of what Al-Qaeda is, was. Um, that's sort of what the Muslim Brotherhood was. That's sort of what the Wahhabi movement was in Saudi Arabia, the Diobandi movement in, in India, and, and so on. That there's a short circuit within Islamic tradition. And again, this is a very, very complicated question, but it works to the advantage of, of the, the organizations who represent themselves as representatives of the of the community. And it, and it also works to the disadvantage of the individual who wants to go a different way. You know, certainly within Islam, there are penalties for um, heresy and leaving the religion that are not found in, uh, in or certainly enforced in, in other religions. And these can be very, very real um, at times. And they can be they can be deadly real. There's a, there's a case being litigated in Texas now. Father killed his two daughters because <clears throat> they had become too Americanized. And it took a number of years to, for it to reach, uh, reach trial. And, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to overstate the prevalence of that by any means, but the, the, the impulse to, to return to the fold, the pressure to return to the fold is very, very real. Um, in a sense, it's much more real than in, in some other communities where you'll simply be cut off. Um, on the other hand, you know, the statistics that I've seen, and again, you can trust or distrust statistics, um, suggest that Tremendous numbers of, of Muslims are leaving, leaving the faith or expressing that they have no, no belief or follow no tradition. What does that mean in larger terms and larger political terms? I don't know. I think it's and it's way too soon to, to say. No, I was um, going to ask you about that because at some time, at time in the past, I was part of a Muslim Jewish dialogue and the majority of the Muslims who came said they were secular, that they didn't go to the mosque and they were happy to meet with Jews and Christians, but they very clearly said they just stopped going to the mosque. So I thought, I didn't know what proportion of the population that would be. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hazard, I wouldn't hazard a guess as to what proportion. I think that people, any people who, regardless of what their religion was, regardless of their orientation, um, if they, if there's a chance for a, a dialogue, have a dialogue. And if that dialogue is, is productive, then great. If that dialogue is not productive, then okay, move on to the, to the next thing. There is a pattern, unfortunately, of, um, Jews in particular, anxiously rushing into di interfaith dialogues with people who are insincere. And um, who and who should have been checked out a little bit more more closely, and you know Jews as a as a peculiar kind of minority in particularly in North America um, have a very strong tradition, very strong impulse to uh, to pursue acceptance and to reach out to anybody who wants to accept them. And this can be good, and this can this can be bad. And unfortunately, um, in the north, in, in the American experience, uh, most Jews, too many Jews, are still extremely suspicious of reaching out to evangelical Christians. And they have this strange 
um, almost innate hostility towards evangelical Christians, um, which is not well founded in in many in most cases in my experience, and with respect to secular Muslims, with respect to most traditional Muslims who who have different attitudes about Jews, I think more dialogue is is necessary, continual dialogue, because that helps all sides. And that helps um, counter the bad actors um, who are who are out there. Thank you. If you've got a few more moments, Alex, uh, there are sure. other questions. Thank you. So one of the questions that's been put is to do with the State Department. And I thought maybe we could generalize a little bit and ask, are there government institutions which in some ways themselves have anti-Semitic tendencies or policies. The example here, of course, is with Leith Maruf. He was funded by a government department. Any inquiry has to ask not just what the organization is that he founded and got funds for, but what's going on inside the department that would have selected to give him the money, right? And I'm wondering if some of the institutions of the arms of government or departments or specific programs, I don't know how to coach it, are themselves reinforcing this anti-racist agenda, which is really anti-Semitic in its actions? Well, I can't speak specifically to the Canadian um, example beyond the, the, the name. Um, well, the State Department was the one that was this, but, uh, but we'll go back to the State Fair. Department. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a very large and longstanding question. And you know, certainly the, the, the State Department and the, the U.S. government as a whole um, was at one time, many years ago, dominated by, well, certainly the State Department, let's, let's be specific, it's dominated by, by um, American Christians, congregationalists, many of whom were the, son, uh, the sons, they're all, they're all men, that point, um, the sons of uh, missionaries, missionaries to the Middle East and the missionary and missionaries to China and, and other parts of, of Asia, who brought um, missionizing, secularized their missionizing tendencies and their uh, tr traditional uh, congregationalist hostility towards Jews and manifest it in American foreign policy, which was on the one hand, extremely pro-Arab, hostile towards certainly towards Zionism, not, not so crazy about Jews in general, to the point of being explicitly anti-Semitic when you came to uh, certain, certain leaders in the State Department and, and the intelligence community in the 40s and the 50s. This is very much changed. Uh, it's not, those people don't dominate um, anything anymore, but there's an, a kind of institutional culture that is, um, and, and it's an institutional culture that was uh, certainly in the State Department, as it relates to Middle East policy, that was very much reproduced and promoted by Jews um, uh, who had key roles or notable roles. I don't want to name anybody's name, names and accuse them of being self-hating or anything. But the idea is that, and, ha, and has always been, that Israel was, a, Israel was an impediment to American policy in the Middle East. American policy in the Middle East from the 1930s, certainly from 1945 onward, explicitly, explicitly was about energy, was about oil, was about maintaining the security of Arab oil producing states and making sure that they could supply the US and the world. And from 1950 or so onward, it was the Cold War as a second, as a second component of this, um, that Israel was an impediment to the successful prosecution of American foreign policy, um, that the US being supportive of Israel would be would push Arab states, Muslim states into the arms of the, of the Soviets. Didn't exactly happen that way. There were, there were associations and dalliances and alliances and so on. Um, Egypt, Syria, most notably, the Saudis were never interested. 
uh, the Iranians were never interested. So, you know, two of the, the big oil producing states. But this this impulse has re, this impulse has remained, and and it and it sort of changed orientation in the 1970s and 80s when the U.S. W began to become involved more and more and more in the Arab-Israeli peace process. And this idea crystallized like a like a pearl in an oyster that the Palestinian issue was the key, the pivot, the crux of all of the other problems. And if that one problem could be solved, then everything else would, would fall into place. Um, it was always, in my view, it was always a myth. Uh, and the US expended immense amounts of energy and money making this, trying to make this so. And the Abraham Accords of the last three years uh, with an outside in approach, a sort of proved the 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 falseness of the original of the original paradigm, um, along with it has to be said Arab and Muslim frustration with the Palestinians who, over and over and over and over and over again, say no to various deals and offers and demand more and more and more and more money and support, and now all the all that they get basically is is lip service from. Um, some of the some of the Muslim states, uh, Arab and Muslim states. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so the State Department is sort of in a in a pickle. And you know, since the Obama administration, the orientation has very much changed. And this was, a, in my view, very much a reflection of Obama's own personal contribution. Um, that the key to Middle East peace and the key to everything is making a deal with Iran. So there was the, the first JCPOA agreement. It's not a treaty. It's just this kind of illegal agreement between leaders that has no actual standing in American law, um, and which is now being renegotiated and renegotiated and renegotiated. And they're, they're inches apart as of this morning, or they're a few feet apart. Presumably, um, once that is solved, then then everything else will fall into place. And it's kind of and it's a kind of manic misunderstanding of of everything, based in large part on Obama and his now you know second tier and third tier um, State Department employees negotiating it. You know, Blinken, Wendy Sherman, <clears throat> these these characters. Um, in which Israel is playing the, literally as of today the same role that it played at the in during the Obama administration as the bad guy, as the foil, as trying to screw up this, this great deal, and um, all criticism is once again focused on Israel. So it reactivates some of the worst sorts of instincts within State Department institutional culture and within the supporting institutional cultures in the media. Um, and within the, the Washington echo chamber, the think tank communities and, and uh, the universities and, and so on. Um, ignore what the Iranians actually say and actually do, which includes, as of yesterday, shooting rockets at American military facilities in Syria. And um, as of yesterday or the day before, literally, you know, an Iranian general saying, you know, this is great. Now we have the chance to, you know, finally destroy the Zionist entity and push the Jews into the sea um, and, and create this, this kind of weird agreement uh, and a pathway to a nuclear weapon. So it plays, you know, people don't understand, I think, that institutions have memories, institution have pa institutions have patterns, that, that policies flow through existing patterns. Um, there really is something called a deep state. It's just bureaucrats doing the same thing over and over again, because that's what they do, and that's what they know, and that's what they like, and that's how they were trained, and that's how they think, and that's how they get paid. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Trump became such a a villainous and hated figure because he broke away from that in a couple of key areas, not in all by any means, but in a couple of key areas and his, his persona 
Um, so you have a personality makeover, it'd be great. We could all use a personality makeover sooner or later. Um, <laughs> or a makeover it is hard sometimes. We all imagine that these so called very intelligent, well educated people keep repeating, as you say, over and over again, any idea of a deal with Iran or any support for the anti Israel when the facts on the ground anyone can see. It's as you know, easy as daylight to see what the truth is, and all these educated people are in denial. They're not so smart. <laughs> That's education is the answer. Um, any final words, Alex? Because I think a lot of the questions that I've seen are about what do we do? This I know it's a big question. What do we do to help our fellow Jews who don't see it deal with it and stand up against this anti-Semitism you're describing? Um, what can we do? This is always this is always the question. Um, you know, arm yourself with knowledge is, is one thing. Um, the thing I always say is if you read only one news source, you are choosing to um, be lied to uh, because whatever that news source is, it's lying to you. If you read two or three, you can begin to triangulate. You don't have to read all of them because that's a recipe for insanity. We leave that to the professionals. Um, but read as much as you can, listen to as much as you can and, and uh, look for, the, look for the, the inconsistencies and the, the gaps. And unfortunately, and, it is, and it's very unfortunate, um, Israel has and anti-Semitism have been characterized in the last few years as very much right-wing issues, right-wing concerns. And traditional media, mainstream media um, have been part of, part of that process of marginalizing information that will give you a, a, a truer picture. And for better and for worse, you sometimes have to go to what are called right-wing media to find out what's actually going on there and, and in the world. Um, if you read the New York, if you read the New York Times, you choose, you decide that you're going to live in a bubble and be lied to and have a have a an uncomfortable view of the world that's oriented in one in one direction. Um, and maybe, yes, when you read down to paragraph 14, you're going to find that piece of information. If you choose to read Breitbart every day, you're going to be slapped across the face with it um, every which way. And that will give you an equally or almost equally misleading picture of how the world works. So go back and forth. You got to triangulate. You got you to find out. And then pick your candidates accordingly and pick your causes accordingly and give money. Um, another thing, never, ever, 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 ever give money to a college or university, period. Mm -hmm. um, that's a whole other discussion. I'd be happy to come back for another hour and a half and talk about that. But <clears throat> give your money judiciously to, to causes and to people that you believe in and support people who, are, who believe in uh, dialogue and in in the the kinds of in the kinds of norms that we north americans um believe in and uh you know and go from there thank you so much i thought this is excellent you've given us a lot of food for thought a lot of information and really great suggestions so i can't thank you enough my pleasure and i hope we will talk again i look forward Thank you. And thanks to all of our sponsors. David's going to put up a slide. One of the questions was, who are the sponsors? How do we reach out to them? And I would ask that you do exactly that. And take care and have a great day. Bye for now.